Welcome to Shaping the NYC Skyline, the podcast that explores the stories behind the buildings that shape our city. I'm your host, David Chamshovich, and I'm here with my co-host, Brenda Slokowski. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Shaping the New York City Skyline. I'm here with David. How you doing? Good. How you doing, Brenda? I'm good. It's a sunny disposition of a day. I feel like I have a youthly disposition, just like your sunny. You have a sunny disposition, and I have a youthly you disposition. You know who else has a youthly disposition? Yeah, who? Jason Dabowski from Hill West Architect, who we actually had a great conversation with. Jason came to our office at Side and Shine to discuss architecture and design and the difficulties yeah. and the challenges and you know the successes that he's had in New York City, his upbringing, where he came from, how he got here. Very interesting stuff. Yeah. I never really had a deep conversation with an architect of his caliber before. I've never had a deep conversation with an architect, period. I've never gotten to see the ins and outs of what goes into designing a building and implementing plans, which was so interesting to hear about. I loved hearing his methodology of starting a project, what consultants you're talking to, and what factors into designating each square foot of a building in your plans. Yeah, I think it was a very engaging conversation. He's certainly very bright. He's been working at Hill West in some shape or form for a decade plus. I appreciate that loyalty. It speaks volumes, right? I mean, somebody who stays with the place stays there for a reason. And Hill West had an amazing reputation before where they were Goldstein Hill West before the prior partner named Parker had retired. Yeah. And Jason is the, an associate partner who's worked with us on a number of projects. And he has an amazing expertise in affordable housing, something that's in terms of zoning, it's very difficult to understand. And he's a jack of all trades, which is yeah. apparently what you have to be as an architect. You have to deal with lots and lots of, like you said, consultants, and you sort of have to know a little bit about everything. And something that was interesting he mentioned was the fact that all of his projects that he's worked on were 421A projects. He moved to New York City because he wanted to work on huge projects, interesting and complicated designs. And of course, zoning in New York City, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it in the country. It's got to be so complicated. And I guess he wants to be here to be with the best of the best and to (laughs) to really shape the New York City skyline. What did you find fascinating about Jason's interview and maybe something that you learned? I learned a lot from Jason, actually. We're on the end where we see the plans that already come to us. And it's interesting to see what goes into drafting those plans and designating each square foot, what height and setback or light and air provisions are very important to a project and floor plate. It was interesting to hear his take on office to residential conversions. Jason Dabowski is an impressive guy. He's also a very nice guy. And we love to work with him. We love to work with Hill West. He's very very smart. He's very smart. He's very well spoken. And he's clearly very successful and he's done very well for himself. Yeah. He's, he mentioned a number of projects that he's working on, all of which are extremely impressive. We can't and, wait for you guys to hear it. Yeah. Go check out Hell West on the internet. See their designs. Check them out on Instagram. And without further ado, Jason Dabowski. The Big Dabowski. What a star architect. Thanks for coming, Jason. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks for having me. It's a real privilege to be here. We're very excited about this opportunity. It's the first architect that we have on the show. And we're so lucky to have someone as prominent as you and who has the experience that you have despite your youth, (laughs) despite your age. Jason, thank you so much for making your way to Side and Shine offices. It's a special treat to get on the subway and come to Midtown for a meeting. (laughs) Leaving the comfort of your own living room is a big deal. (laughs) No, we're in the office four days a week, but uh, I'd say we do do a fair amount of our meetings on Zoom these days. Oh, that's that's definitely helpful. I'll tell you, I enjoyed the Zoom meetings. It cuts down on travel time. It's super great. For sure. So, Jason, we're very interested in, in talking to you and understanding how you came about to become an architect. I know you're from Texas. Yep. I grew up in North Dallas. I was... Spent the first 22 years of my life, you know, in the DFW Metroplex, including college. I went to the University of Texas at Arlington. It was nice to have somewhere where it was an hour away, far enough away to get a dorm, but close enough away, you know, to to come home on the weekend. Architecture has different programs in, at school. There's a the four-year program, there's a five-year program, and then there's the second part of the four-year program, which is a two-year master's degree. So different schools have different offerings. 
particularly the Arlington campus, had the four plus two, which was intriguing to me. I wasn't necessarily ready to commit to a five-year program. And so I did the four-year program. And then at the end of that, kind of had this itch to come to New York and try something new. I didn't know that I was going to stay here forever. I thought I might come for a couple of years to cut my teeth and then go back to school. I never did. What made you decide to go to architecture in the first? So I would say I was always mathematically inclined as a kid. And yeah, I was, you know, in the honors math classes as a kid, cause sort of dual enrollment type stuff, getting college credits in high school, had a hard time in physics. So when it came down to selecting between architecture and engineering, with the struggle in physics, I kind of steered <laughs> towards architecture. And it's been a great fit. You said the numbers are, are something that you enjoy, but did you necessarily know that numbers were a big part of being an architect? No, not necessarily. I mean, you, the numbers that we work with are incredible. You know, it, it's not just the dimensions of a room, but it's the minimum square feet of a room or a dwelling unit and the most efficient way to lay that out. Uh, some of the buildings that we work on are over 1 million square feet. Wow. And, you know, you talk about tabulating every single square foot in that building. You got trained in Texas and then you came to New York. But how does that translate? Did your education, is it different practicing in this field in a different state like it would be for an attorney? Or is it sort of apples to apples and it doesn't really matter where, where you are? Different states have different paths to licensure. And one of the reasons that I came to New York is that there is a path to licensure with a four-year degree. You just have to uh, be an intern for longer. And, and by an intern, I mean track your hours with the authority that, that governs that, which is called NCARB. So, yeah, you know, you track your hours and then you become eligible to test. And depending on how long you go to school, that matches up with how long you have to track your hours. So is that, that what you did? You decided, I like New York. I want to stay here. I want to start. I want to get licensed in, in New York and stay and work here. You know, I think looking back, I wasn't, uh, I didn't really know what I want, except I knew that I wanted to leave Dallas. I'd been there for 22 years and was looking for something different. And as it turns out, you know, I ended up getting paired up with an incredible group of people, the professionals that I work with at the firm. I started out my career in 2006 at Casas Candilas and Partners. That firm was on the up in that current cycle. And then as the financial crisis hit, the firm got hit and was ultimately dissolved in 2009. There were five or six partners there at the time with Casas Candilas, and three of them in 2009, as Casas Candilas was being dissolved, went and started a new firm, Goldstein, Hill, and West. So that's Alan Goldstein, Stephen Hill, and David West. Some Friday afternoon, they came around and tapped 17 of us on the shoulder and said, hey, on Monday, come to the seventh floor. You're going to have a desk there. So same building, huh? Same building. <laughs> we sublit from an engineering firm that we were friends with, uh, you know, coordinated with, worked on jobs with. And so there were 17 of us. We survived with some of our existing projects in, you know, 2009. And in 2010, 2011, things started to pick up, as you all know, and then 12, 13, you know, it just took off in that last condo cycle. And we've really thrived. We had a, a, a large upscaling effort where we went from say 20 to 50 to 100 very quickly. But then we found the scale that we needed to be at to effectively operate our firm. And right now we're about 100 people and that's the right number for us. We don't see ourselves really growing much or contracting much. It's a good number for us. We're being assigned to work on a large rental project downtown and a medium-sized condominium project in Midtown. So there was a mix of product that the firm was working on at that time. And I'd say as things went on, it progressed more towards rental in that time uh -huh. with, I'd say, my first kind of foray into condo projects coming in 2010, 2011, right? And then that being that last, at least at the last condo cycle where the, the condominiums were still eligible yeah. for 421A. Did, do you see, what's the difference between designing a rental building versus a condo building? Is there Are there differences? Your perspective? Uh, there are, I would say, the, obviously the finishes, the room sizes. There's a different type of detail that we pay to each project. In rental projects, you know, there's a there's a priority on on floor efficiency, you know, and designing the most efficient units, right? Where in condominiums, there's extra attention paid to how do you sell this off of a floor plan? How do you sell this off a piece of paper? Because a lot of times, the condominium projects that we work on. They come to market while the job is still in construction, and they're hopefully selling out by the time we finish. So you really have to have the sense and understanding, put yourself in the mindset of the business people 
when you're designing these the rental or condo, right? Because yeah. they're different. Yep. And there's, I'd, I'd say a key team member of that process, whether it's rental or condo, is, is going to be the marketing consultant. Since I've been, you know, involved in the field for 17 years now, I'd say there's been a progression of involvement by the marketing consultant on all these projects. And they're side by side with you at the table in the early phases of the project, picking apart the layout, you know, with the owner. If you can remember that far back, what do you think your first day, month, week was like? What what were you doing at that time? No, so I remember it vividly. <laughs> I, I was fortunate enough. It was a traumatic experience. Yeah. No, it's I was very etched in your brain. <laughs> I was. I know how you feel, by the way. <laughs> I was fortunate enough to have some incredible mentors early on in my career, and part of you know what made me the person that I am today. But I remember my first day of work. They were pouring the 39th floor of 10 Barclay Street. It was a project that we had worked on. That the construction documents were complete. And the team that I was assigned to was servicing the project through construction administration. So 10 Barclay Street is a 58-story building downtown on the financial district for Glenwood Properties. And, and I remember that vividly my first day. That was so Because you guys were doing the administration, you were actually able to physically go to the property and, yep. and see it. Yep. We deal with a ton of buildings, but we don't necessarily see those buildings. We don't there's sometimes we're invited to ribbon cuttings and things like that, but as intimately involved as we are with the buildings, we don't necessarily get to see the action. How, how often how often do you actually get to see the site, the construction? How often do you get to talk to the, to the people who are actually doing the work and, and building the design that, that you create? So during the construction administration period of a project, there's what we call weekly OACs, owner, architect, contractor meetings. Those are hosted and run by the general contractor and the owner and the consultants are there. And they give status updates on the construction progress. We talk about how many open shop drawings there are or how many open RFIs there are. And so those happen weekly. COVID has changed things in terms of how often we go to the site, but those happen weekly and we try to be there weekly. If we're not there weekly, we're on Zoom weekly and we're there monthly. Are you the first stop on any developer's project? Like when when a developer decides that they have a, an empty piece of land, is the first stop the architect office? Yeah, so that's a great question. I think part of what separates our from some of the other firms is we have a tremendous zoning department in, in our office led by David West. And so projects start in the zoning department. They come in as a feasibility study. Somebody's got a lot. Maybe they're thinking about buying a lot next to it. And so we study what can be built on that lot, and we call it a feasibility study. We do quite a bit of those. We've studied a lot, a lot of different sites throughout the year. And yeah, David West knows a lot about zoning. He probably knows as anybody, as anybody, any architect that I know, at least. What sort of challenges have you seen how the design work and the actual construction work, how they work together? If you want to use a horror story as an example, I, I won't hold you to, you don't have to say names, but everybody likes horror stories. I'll say that deviations from the drawings that happen in the field, it's the contractor's obligation to point those out to us. And we generally would give a thumbs up or a thumbs down. I think what we pay extra attention to are deviations that affect code compliance, particularly accessibility. Accessibility is is a huge is a huge thing for us, designing equal opportunity housing for everybody. And construction tolerances are like maybe an eighth of an inch is kind of the most you're going to get away with on an accessibility concern. So having uh, any deviation from that that needs to be remediated. Maybe you sort of can juxtapose how you started off your career and, and where you are now, because I know that's there's a there's probably a world of change that's happened. Yeah, sure. I, I was very fortunate in the first half of my career from 2006 to 2014. I had the opportunity to work on 10 different projects. Uh, nine of them got built and eight of them I was hands on from beginning to end, um, which is pretty rare, but it happens. I will say one thing about our office is that the majority of the work that comes through our office does get built. Uh, you know, they're real world designs that aren't sort of whimsical fantasies. So you can walk down the streets of New York City and just be like, hey, I designed yeah. that. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a great feeling. Yeah. You are actually shaping the New York City skyline. <laughs> yeah. I love when we mention the name of the podcast. I know. So I would say throughout those projects from 06 to 14, my roles and responsibilities just grew incrementally with every project. So you know, being called to junior designer and continuing to grow through the job captain role and project manager role. That was just sort of a natural progression from sort of project to project mm -hmm. that happened. Still in all of those roles, uh, very actively part of the drafting and production team, but 
drawing different things and having, you know, responsibility for different things during that process. Yeah. How do you keep up with the new stuff? There's different resources available. I'd say first off is the AIA where they have regular presentations scheduled at their space in at the Center for Architecture on LaGuardia Place. For example, last month they had one on lower Manhattan flood resiliency, which is a kind of a hot topic, you know. And so that's one resource. Uh, we also have lunch and learns at our office, which are pretty great where you get uh, salespeople coming in with their product, uh, but they're also there to educate you. You get continuing education credits as an architect to maintain your licensure. And lunch. Um, and lunch. That's Some, how we do CLE credits. Yeah. And then, you know, there's also conventions. The Build Expo, for example, that was here in New York City a few months ago. That's an annual event. The AIA convention was just held last month in San Francisco, where actually David West gave a presentation on the history of housing in New York City. Wow. Obviously, when you have a new material that comes out, whatever it is, it's a glass deal, a facade, whatever, whatever it is. Bird-friendly material. I'm just saying, yeah, bird-friendly material that, that I know that's something that we had discussed with you earlier. How do you feel about recommending that stuff when it hasn't been necessarily tested on lots of buildings, especially if it's, if it's fairly new? I assume you want to sort of... You don't want to be the guinea pig that says, this is a great material, and then it deteriorates, and then you've got to have egg on your face. Yes, it is a difficult position to be in. Uh, we do not want to sort of reinvent things or, or be the first to test out products uh, that are coming to market. It's something that we shy away from, I would say. Right, so there was a local law passed a few years ago. It took effect for filings, uh, I think, in January 2020 where the first 75 feet of uh, the, the building needs to have uh, what's deemed a bird-friendly material. And there's new products that are available. At first, there was a very limited selection, but it's becoming more readily available, and we're starting to see it installed for the first time in some of those buildings. That- so as a layman who doesn't know any of these materials, what is considered a bird-friendly material? Something that they won't bump into? Yeah. So as I understand it, there was a bird conservancy group that was concerned about the birds flying into reflective surfaces. They did some tests and decided the materials would have a bird threat rating. And so now materials have bird threat ratings and you have the right rating, you can put it on. Okay. The the power of lobbyists. I guess. We're going to have a Superman rated window once (laughs) and Superman... No, he's, he's made a steal. He can just, he can just fly through it. He's okay. And it's not a burr. But it's something that it's just now starting to be installed given its effective date. You know, there were some jobs that really rushed to beat that deadline, filing before the end of the year in, in 2019. So jobs that were filed in 2020, they're just now starting to get built. Uh-huh. I'm curious to know how that affects construction costs. Like, is the bird friendly material more expensive? Like, hmm. it's just a thought-provoking question for our audience if anyone wants to answer do you know Jason? no I, I i'm sure there's some upcharge to it but i, I don't <laughs> know the value one of the newer laws that came about recently is local law 97 how does that impact your design process and is it making things more complicated yeah so local law 97 is a buildings emission limit law some people call it the carbon tax it takes effect in in 2025 and basically there's a prescribed per square foot metric that's been established for various building types and uses. The first compliance period is 2024 through 2029. They have civil penalties that will be starting in 2025. The whole idea is based on the grid going green and trying to reduce our reliance on natural gas. And so the way that we're seeing projects prepare is trending more towards what we're calling an all electric building or at least reducing the amount of gas-fired equipment in a building. I'd say many buildings are shying away from the conventional gas-fired boilers. Some are electing to go with electric boilers. We're eliminating cooling towers and switching more in favor of what's called an air source heat pump. These are monster pieces of equipment that can live. They, They need to live outside. They need a lot of air. You can put them sort of in a building, but in an outdoor space that is properly ventilated. But generally, we're seeing them placed up on roofs. Does it feel more complicated doing a a new residential building given the the, those obligations, or is it just just another thing that you have to do? It's not doesn't really complicate it. I don't think it's more complicated. I think there's different factors to take into account. For example, if there's no gas, then you don't have to worry about the gas risers within the residential floors serving the gas cooktops. Right? It's just 
actually probably cheaper to not have that because of the way it needs to be built. But then, like you said, the, the equipment that's required on the roof we're seeing is substantially larger than anything that we're used to providing. When you first got here in 2006 versus, I don't know, maybe you can compare it to then the 2008, 2009 financial crisis, then 2010, 2011 when it started picking up, and then the good times roll over the next 10 years, and now maybe those sort of periods, uh, that's where I'm placing the bookmark. Right. Are you seeing any similarities between yeah. the downturn that occurred post-financial crisis in 2008 as it is compared to now? Yeah. And the sorts of buildings that you're you're working on, how has that changed? Yeah. So I think one thing that I watched happen and become much more prevalent and still is today is the rise of the Starkitect or the, or the branded building here in New York City. And so I think maybe like 15 Central Park West was, was one of the first sort of most successful uh, buildings in that sense. And there's just been this continued trend over the years to have branded buildings that are designed by famous architects. We've we do a fair amount of collaborations. Most of our work, I'd say 70% of our work is what we call full service, where we are the architect of record and the design architect. About 30% of our work we do as executive. So where we're paired up with, called a Starkitect. Uh, one of the projects that I worked on personally was the 56 Leonard Tower in Tribeca for Alexico and Isaac Senbahar. So that was designed by Herzog and Demuron around that time. And like I said, it's just been a continued trend to have this brand. And, and sometimes you have these jobs that have these high profile exterior designers paired up with a different high profile interior designer. You see it in Miami too, where they have, you know, like the Porsche building. It, they want to create a brand. And how does that happen? I mean, they're celebrity chefs, right? <laughs> David Chang, Anthony Bourdain. How do you become a star? Yeah, that's exa exactly my question. See, we yeah. finish each other's sentence sandwiches. Those were <laughs> sandwiches. How do you become a star architect? What, is a, what a differentiates that from just a regular ordinary architect? Well, so what we've seen, again, I think it's a, a brand that they can market and sell. And as much as we love the Hill West brand, you know, maybe a marketing consultant will say, well, I'd rather have Herzog and Demuron or Robert A.M. Stern. And so that sells better, I guess. It's a name. It's like, it's like Gucci or Versace, right? right. Yeah. Versus like Old Navy or... I feel like there's got to be some in between there. <laughs> I don't know. Close. There. The brand, I think what, what we're seeing is, in, especially in these high-end condominium projects, the brand sells. No, I, I think it makes sense. And you see a lot of these buildings that have name, like, you know, the Orion, the Platinum. I used to live in the Platinum. There's a name. Did? The Costa Scandalous yeah. Project. Wow. Is that? Wow. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. I had no idea. O Look at that. 05 A04. That's where I live. I bought a, I bought a unit pre-construction developed by SJ, SJP Properties. Yep. I bought a, quarter, a little corner unit in one bedroom. Yeah. Pre-construction. world. I had no idea that you guys had, had designed that. It was before my time, but I did have some involvement, you know, post-occupancy, close out, just tying up loose ends. You are constantly dealing with DOB and the DOB process. What is the DOB process entail? How many times do you go back and forth? Is it, does it take years? Does it take months? Just an overall picture for the group. So I'd say for us, normally we go to DOB with our initial filing set, right? at the end of design development. But some of these projects are incredibly complex, large sites that have incredibly complex issues that we necessarily aren't fully confident in and, or we want to get a second opinion from the DOB on. And that's been excellent to have the ability to go to the DOB, meet in person with the commissioner, the hub commissioner, Scott Pavon, and talk through these highly technical issues with drawings and discuss, you know, interpretations and whether we're reading things correctly or whether we're complying correctly. So the DOB has made themselves available to the professionals, the expediters or, or the liaison and setting that meeting up. But but that that's a huge benefit to us uh, here in New York City. Expediters have the in. They're able to they file things, they get the ear of the person that whatever agency they're going to. But why is that necessary? Why is it that the development team can't do that themselves? Why do they need an expediter to act as a go-between? Is there a reason or is it just they are familiar with the process and they can get it done. They are the middleman. They they truly do expedite the process. I think they're, it's their job to be the squeaky wheel, to get the appointment, to get the approval, to ask the questions, and they're good at it. I, I think they're an integral part to the process. There has been a trend. You know, you used to print three sets of drawings and walk them into the DOB. And, On paper? Yep. <laughs> Whoa. Need a lot of papers. Mm -hmm. Like, what kind of printer sizes? Are you, are you printing them in like 
15 by 11? What? Uh, you know, we used to print drawings as big as 54 by 36, but the DOB has since like changed it? their rules. It's 48 by 36 is the max. Well, you're not still printing them, are you? We're not printing them anymore. We print to PDF. The way that it's changed now, they, they, they've created what's called the hub, and it all happens electronically. We sign and seal drawings electronically. We upload them. We conduct plan examinations electronically via Zoom. And that's how the, the job goes. So the process is, is that you have these early consultation meetings with the DOB. You get a level of confidence on these highly technical issues early on. You proceed with your design. You go through schematic design, design development. Those periods could take anywhere from three to four months individually. Um, and then at the end of DD, you would file your drawings at the DOB. You'd wait for comments. You'd continue on with your construction documents. And some period of time later, depending on how busy the DOB is, you get objections from the examiner. You then respond to the objections. Maybe you need to add an exit sign or maybe your apartment wasn't big enough for minimum room sizes, whatever it may be. You solve those things, you resubmit the drawings and you go for plan exam resolution. You get one hour and you just go through the list and you resolve comments. Technically, you only get five meetings. So then you need special permission on some of these highly complex jobs to get extra meetings. We do see jobs that have affordable housing get priority from the DOB. And I think that's great. Kudos to them. And do they get the ins and outs of that or are they just relying on APD because they're the ones that are reviewing those plans? I would say I'm not entirely sure how it flows through their hands, but it's a box that's checked on a form. And so then it you know, it shows up in the system as having affordable housing. Which makes sense because that's HP sign up is for. But you don't have you don't have an understanding one way or the other. Well I would say DOB they're paying close attention to the zoning aspects of the inclusionary housing application. Whereas in our experience I see HPD paying more attention to the architectural aspects of an inclusionary housing application. So DOB is looking to make sure that your zoning floor area, your inclusionary housing area, all that adds up. Right. Whereas, say, an HPD build review, they're making sure that your unit is, you know, 400 square feet per studio. And how has your experience been with with Built? For those who don't know, Built is uh, building land development services. They're the architect team at HPD that reviews plans from for affordable housing, whether it's inclusionary housing or fully affordable building. How has your experience been with with them? With I've done uh, five inclusionary housing projects, and two of them have gone through the Built review. The way it works these days is you submit, of course, after the Side and Shine team <laughs> has gone through it with a fine tooth comb and that it is the appropriate file size. You submit it and then it's, a, a, I guess, a random audit process where they decide whether or not your job gets a build review. And so I, I've been through uh, two of those and they're challenging, no doubt. They do add some time to the project schedule. Uh, sometimes it uh, takes a couple tries to get all of the objections resolved, but you know, on the situations where we've not gotten audited, you know, that's like, you know, everybody's thrilled that it just kind of keeps the project moving along in its intended schedule. Yeah, for sure. What what sorts of projects do you do you generally work? So at, at Hill West, I'd say 98% of our work is multifamily residential. When we work on mixed use projects, there'll be maybe a commercial office component on the lower podium floors, or maybe a retail component on the first floor or cellar parking garage, below grade, that sort of thing. Uh, but the predominant use and product that we design is multifamily residential. I'd say starting in 2017, 2018, we, we had success in branching out outside of the boroughs. And we've started to do more work in Westchester, in White Plains, in New Rochelle, and in, in New Jersey as well. Is it the first time that you guys have ventured out? I'd say in, in the current firm, Goldstein Hill West, now Hill West, in 2017 is, is when we first started doing some work outside of the boroughs. The old firm uh, that I first started at, Costas Candilas and Partners, I think had done one or two outside the city. There are, you know, just like we are the well, one of the well-known architects here in the city, there are architects who specialize and kind of have that market cornered. So it was difficult for us to break into those markets. But for example, Eleven Lawton came to us through a referral for one of our current clients. They had referred somebody to us who had bought a portfolio of defunct Chase banks, and they had spun some off into you know doctors' offices or community centers. But there was this one particular bank in New Rochelle. It was the former city of New Rochelle Bank, I think, an old historic building that's listed on the National Register of Historic Places. And it was just mixed up in this portfolio that they had bought. So they realized uh, the favorable development climate that, that exists in New Rochelle, and they quickly put together an assemblage to meet the criteria 
for what is the tallest building or what hopefully will be the tallest building in New Rochelle in the, in the DOZ1 area. And so we went through the process of getting that entitled. It was very friendly process, I would say. It took probably, you know, once we had our drawings ready to go, it was a three-month process. Wow. wow. You know, we, we had probably six months of work to do to kind of get there with the design. But once we were ready to go and we called up the city and said, we're ready to come see you, it was three months. So is it their local department of buildings that, that you're dealing with there? So they have a city planning group uh, and then they have a department of buildings. The fire department was also closely involved in, in, in all of those reviews because we're building buildings at a scale that really you know hasn't been seen uh, so much there. As it has here. So you're going through these reviews where you wouldn't necessarily have that in New York City because New York City is filled with these big buildings. It's old hat. Well, what's great about New York City is that it's as of right. So, uh, and a lot of our buildings are as of right. We do do some uh, master plan rezoning Euler type of work that obviously have a lot of community and public involvement, but the vast majority of our work is as of right. There's not, you know, a community board that wants to see what color brick you're going to be installing here in New York City. So I think that's part of what makes New York City so great. Whereas in some of these other municipalities, you do have to go through a design review board process and they have local residents and design professionals that sit on those boards that guide the design. So is that what you did for this project? Did you have to make an appearance before the community? Yes. Like a presentation? Yes. In, in all of our projects, White Plains and New Rochelle and even in Newport, uh, the community board presentations are a prerequisite. And how are you finding the people in the community to be, I've attended some of these community board meetings in connecting with inclusionary housing projects. Lots of personality. Yeah, lots of personalities. There's a lot of, uh, say, conflict, distrust. Just people are generally not happy with the developers who they view as, you know, uh, very wealthy people who are coming in and going to cause gentrification. And they're not 100% wrong, but they're not 100% right either. Maybe you can give us some information about how that works in Westchester and how those people Take, take these projects in? I think that no matter where you are, that there's people in the community, you know, rightfully so, that want more affordable housing. And, and I don't mean affordable in the sense of low income. I just mean like affordable to regular people instead of building more luxury housing, more luxury condos. They want normal people housing. Yeah. I think it's key because we want, we want people, we want housing for everybody, not just yeah. people low income, we want middle income, moderate income. Yeah. Luxury seems to be the only thing that's, that's being built nowadays, though, given that there's no, there are no incentives to do, to do other things. Oh my God. Should we talk about 421A? No, we're not talking about 421A. We told, I told myself I would not talk about 421A again. <laughs> I actually want to go back to Brenda's and David's comment about affordable housing. And um, how did you guys get started on that? You mentioned that you, ha you yourself have worked on five affordable housing projects. How did you get started on that? I would say, I think probably all of the rental projects that I've worked on in my career, I think all of them are for 21A jobs in some sense. You know, going back to some of the early Columbus Square projects for the, the Chatreets yeah. uh, uptown, they all had some 421A component. It was a different 421A program that didn't have the same affordability requirements that Affordable New York has. But we've been working on inclusionary housing projects for a long time. And, and the difference between inclusionary housing and affordable housing is the inclusionary housing, what we would call the, the zoning part of the affordable housing, where there's a floor area requirement tied to it. Whereas the Affordable New York program is the program that is for tax benefits. And how did you, like I said, David West is one of the people that I think knows so much about inclusionary housing and affordable housing and zoning. That doesn't surprise me that he's, you know, he's reviewing that. How did uh, Hill West get the reputation it does? Because you're the star architects of inclusionary housing. Is that? <laughs> yeah, I love it. Oh, hey, I we'll, love it. We'll We've take been it. looking for a comparison. Star architects <laughs> of inclusionary housing. We'll take it. So, you know, you, you build a reputation like that. You know, you heard Al Alvin's podcast and Jay side and that sort of, I was really interested in seeing how they became who they were. How did they become known as that person? So how do you think your firm or if you know, how did, how did they get that reputation? Or was it just sort of built up slowly one project, another project, and then just got a lot of referrals? Well, well, we specialize in housing. And I think we've been following the trends of 421A and affordable housing. And it just has become this normal thing where a job that comes in the office, it's rental, it's going to have 421A or it's going to be some component to it. And we got pretty good at it. Unfortunately, it's not a thing anymore. 
But I think just from working on it and following the market trends for so many, for so long, for so many projects, I think, you know, we all have a, a pretty good understanding of now the old program. Have, have you worked on any 100% affordable buildings? Or has, has I last? have. I did one and it was a generating building on the same zoning lot. It was actually an heirs project. It is an heirs project, a PFAS. Yeah. If you could tell, you know, just, just to mention what. Wait, I know which projects you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. We worked on it together. Yeah. Yeah. PFAS. So, so privately, privately funded. Privately financed affordable senior housing. Yes. yes. Yeah. That's it. It's in such a good name, right? Yes. Awesome. I was calling it PFAS for such a long time. I just, I just assumed it was French. It took a long time to, to come to reality. And I think you guys were instrumental in getting the term sheet actually out of HPD. Goes quickly, then retract. <laughs> you know. Yeah, we got it, and then it's like we got the date, and then the girl calls the night before, and then says, "Sorry, it's, I'm bailing." Yeah. So how how was I mean? I think that's, rude, by the way. Don't yeah. do that. <laughs> Don't cancel me the night before. The uh, the heirs were just up. affordable, independent residents for seniors, and the reason that was canceled and turned into, I guess, PFAS is privately financed, and HPD and maybe other city agencies don't like non-publicly financed affordable senior housing. But this one... Which doesn't really make any sense. Yeah. I will say the one thing that I, I found unique about that project is that we were required to match the mix of the market rate building. And so we found ourselves designing two and three bedroom PFAS units uh, that I wonder who the user of, who, who the user yeah. would be of those. Studios and one bedrooms at the most really is what a yeah. senior would want, right? We could have gotten unless, higher yeah. dwelling unit count had we not been tied to matching the mix. Yeah. Well, that- unless you have a senior person who is living with their family, because you only needed at least one person in the unit who's 62 or older. You probably work on one of the maybe 10 to 15, I think, you know, PFAS projects that happened. Maybe you'll come back again. Not likely. Mm-hmm. Was there anything challenging in that process? There wasn't really any precedent because it hadn't happened before. Yeah, it was. Um, I think the, the building in and of itself, we kept pretty simple. It was a challenging site to develop on as a height factor zoning site in Jamaica, Queens. There were open space constraints. There were parking requirements for the market rate building that put a huge burden on the site and kind of influenced a little bit of, of the airs, PFAS mm-hmm. buildings design. That was a challenge. But had it been sort of on its own, sort of freestanding, not tied to this other very complicated site. Does that happen often where you have either with a client or with an agency, it doesn't have to be HP, another agency, where somebody says, you should do it this way. They're trying to do something where it seems practical or seems even like this. you want to make sure that the market rate, the affordables are sort of on the same footing. But then again, their proposition doesn't make sense, whether from a financial perspective or how it's going to be utilized. Have you experienced any of that? And then if so, have you, how have you dealt with it? I don't have anything related to affordable housing that comes top of mind. But uh, another example I can think of is that some of the, the flood regulations have recently changed in New York City, where we, we used to be able to build dry flood-proof cellars for buildings, residential buildings that were in a flood zone. And in a dry flood-proof cellar, we were allowed to put mechanical equipment, amenities, uh, such as, say, like a pet grooming room or a tenant laundry room, we were allowed to put in a dry fl- floodproof cellar up until last year, maybe maybe 18 months ago, the DOB had changed their interpretation of the FEMA regs, and now they no longer allow these types of uses in a dry floodproof cellar that are tied to residential. So what is permitted now, like a bike room, tennis storage? storage? Yeah. So you could park cars in a dry floodproof cellar, but you can't have any other uses really my question was about the city of yes of hell yes i call it the city of hell yes and you mentioned earlier that the parking stress on the airs building was really difficult and i think that's one of the things that they want to change is to sort of make things more simple and to take out things that historically were problematic or necessary that are no longer the case do you have any thoughts on their proposal we are hearing a lot of chatter and we are seeing a lot of sites come across our desks to study for conversions. And there are some proposed proposed zoning text changes that will make conversions more favorable. Do like conversions from office to residential. Right. Right. So so right now in in New York City pre-1961 or in lower Manhattan pre-1977 are eligible for conversion under MDL. And that's just a more favorable path to compliance in dealing with depths of yards, sizes of courts, and the ability to convert 
the entirety of the building to residential versus just the portion that is under 10 or 12 FAR. So there are some proposed tech changes out there that uh, we hope to see enacted that will make conversions easier to do in more buildings and in a greater geographical area. And does Hill West have any experience in doing, or have you do you have any personal experience doing any conversions? Yes. So I've done two. One was a condominium in Tribeca, uh, and then another one was a project that we did with your team, the Park Hill City project in Jamaica. That was an old hospital that we cut, chopped, extended, and reshaped the floor plates to be of residential depth. Uh, and even added then, I think, nine stories on top of it and created 481 apartments in an old hospital building. And what are, what are the complications there? Because to me, it seems like it's easier to start from scratch than to have to build on top of something that's, a, that's already there. Yeah, well, the, the structure, I think, is one of the biggest challenges. You need to have good drawings of the existing conditions from the, all the latest conversions that have come across on our desks. We get access to call it the plan room or the war room or the data room, whatever you want to call it. And it is just this massive treasure trove of, of files. And sometimes in there, there's even, you know, scans of original blueprint drawing, which wow. is pretty cool. And, and so, you know, the, the data or the history of the site of the building is incredibly important to have and, and, and also to understand, not just to have. So understanding, you know, what the existing structure is, what the existing foundation system is, what the capacity of that existing structure and foundation is critical. You know, there's, there's experts to help us with that. As, as architects, we know a little bit about everything, but then we have engineers that know everything about their discipline. Yeah. So we have structural engineers, mechanical engineers, we have exterior wall consultants, code consultants. They're all part of the team. How do you piece this all together? Yeah. How do you do that? Everyone, every single one of them is different. They all have very different challenges to overcome. I think, you know, the biggest challenge is, is legal light and air and, and how to get it. Legal light exactly. and air refers to the size of the window and how much of it is operable. And there's different rules depending on whether you're following New York City zoning. Normally, you say 30 feet or to clear in front of the window gives you legal light and air. Whereas if you're following MDL, it can be less than that. Uh, you can do courts that are maybe 20 by 20. There's different, I guess it's more favorable to, to, to use MDL for conversions in that sense. And so legal light and air is calculated based on the room size. If a room is uh, just whatever the room area is, you need 10% of that room area to be glazed vision glass. And then half of that glazed vision glass, 5% needs to be optical. So people have some light and air. Yeah. That's the, that's the right amount of light now. That's somebody decided exactly that. Exactly 30 feet. <laughs> it's different in IBC. In Westchester, I think it's four and eight instead of five and 10. Oh, wow. so there's a lot of light air in there. So they figured, yeah, you'll make it to five. But if you're in New York City, you need more. <laughs> five and well, Jason, thank you so much yeah, for before, coming in. But before we go, of course, we want to make sure that you share, you know, whatever your information is. If you have. Uh, right. Tell people where to media. follow you on socials and how to contact you if they're interested in reaching out? Yeah, sure. We're at hillwest.com. We're on Instagram as hillwest. And we're downtown in the financial district at 11 Broadway. So let us know if you have a site. You're inviting people to come to your office. <laughs> That's if, we, if they have a site. <laughs> okay, fair. You know, Brenda's going to be there with an oak tag uh, right. uh, yelling your name. TRL like The other Jason. day. Remember, Jason spells his last name with an I instead of right. a Y at the end. By the way, I've taken note of that because mine ends in a Y. Yeah. So I was like, ah, not me. Jason, thank you so much for coming in. It was spectacular meeting you. We've, we've worked so much, but we've actually not met physically. Yeah. And it's it's great to see you. And Love hearing your perspective. Yeah, thank we, you so much. We absolutely adore you and Hill West, and we work so much with you. And yeah. uh, we hope that we have a wonderful future ahead as well. But we're excited to see the podcast grow. And uh, again, thanks for having me. Great. Right. Worth. Thank, thank you. you. Well, everyone, that's our show. Thanks so much for listening. And of course, don't forget to subscribe. Also, don't forget to leave comments because we love to hear from our audience. Right, Brenda? Yeah. Feel free to reach out at info at sideandshine.com or visit our website at sideandshine.com. We really look forward to hearing from you. You could also reach out to David and Brenda at dshamshovich at sideandshine.com <laughs> and bslikowski at sideandshine.com. Those are lengthy last names. You can just find us on our website. That's right. <laughs> 